so they can continue to carry it on. So we are so thankful for our children. God bless them. Thank you for each of them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to New Life Christian Ministries. We're so glad that you chose to worship here with us today. We are in a new series called, that, called We Are His Body. And today's message is entitled, Christ Loves His Church. He loves his church. So, Lord, we thank you for what we're about to hear. Lord, I ask that you would anoint me to speak these words, God, in a way that they are powerful, God, and that they become faith as they, are in, as they enter into their ears. May it be entered as faith because your body needs to move. And your word says that we shall live by faith. Where does that faith come from? It comes from the word of God. So as the word of God goes forward, we go forward because it empowers us with faith that we might live and move and have our being in you. I ask that you will forgive us of all of our sins and trespasses. God, save us from ourselves, especially our love for this world. Lord, we don't want to be drunk off the pleasures and entertainment of this world. Our desire is to obey you and your greatest command, which is to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength. God, we need it to get to all because you gave us your all. So, Lord, I pray over these saints of God that their ears will be open to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to his church. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We are so excited to have you here this morning. God is definitely uh, here with us. And now it's time for us to learn. We're here to learn, not just because this is a, a religious routine or activity. We're here to learn because it is God's will that we do so, that we know his word. For his word did say that his sheep uh, know his voice and a stranger they will not follow. Amen. So Christ loves his church. He loves us. And the church is not a building. The church is not a denomination. The church is those in which he came to save. Say this with me. I am, I am his, church. his church. The building isn't his church. OK, it's where his church meets. We got to get that through our minds. This is not his church. This building is not his church. This is just where his church meets, right? Just like a, I almost talked about a restaurant. Lord, help me. <laughs> Haven't even said a Bible verse about to talk about a restaurant. Give me strength, God. We are his body. Christ loves his church. God is love. And he came down from heaven for those who will be called his own. We are his body, his church, his beloved. Many years, some of us have been going to church, but have failed to be or have an understanding of who we are as his church, as the body of Christ. We have been put on this earth and saved to make an impact. Can you say impact? A lot of people can go to church their whole entire lives and never make an impact outside of the building. And that's not what he's called his church to do. We are simply an extension of Jesus Christ while on this earth. We are his ambassadors in which he has put his power and his spirit and his love and given us his dominion. The first thing we're going to learn about his love for his church is that love came for us. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. Love came for us. And when I say love, that word is interchangeable with God. Because we're going to learn here that God is love. All right? 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. It says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What is God? Love. love. 
God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. So the life we have as the body of Christ came from the death of Christ on the cross. There was a price to pay. Oh, my goodness. Jesus did not die on the cross so that he could make church members, religious people who could meet in buildings. He died on the cross so that his power could be spread on earth through those who would believe on him. You see, Adam sinned and everyone that was born from Adam is born into sin. But Jesus is the second Adam and he came to make a whole new race of people. I know we still kind of look the same, but on the inside we have been changed. We have been changed into a new creation because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Say this with me. We are are his church. That changes everything. We're not just a church. We're not just church members, but we are his church. Amen. First Corinthians six and 20 tells us for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Say this with me. I must honor God with my body. So listen to me. Our eyes are not for lusting. Our tongues are not for lying. Our hands are not for mischief. They belong to God. And it's always it's always confused and puzzled me that we have so much respect for this building, but not for this temple. There's things that you would never say to your wife. There's things that I would never say to my wife in this building. But I leave this building and I'll say something that I should not say to her. There's things that I would never do in this building. Never. I would never. This is God's building. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to listen to that. But out there, we'll watch it and we'll listen to it. What's the great disconnect? We think that this building is the church and has the power when the truth is that we are the church. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are where he lives. And the Bible says that we were bought with a high price, so we must honor God with our body. The second thing that we must learn as it relates to God's love for us and how love came down for us is that God perished for you. As many times as I've heard John 3, 16 and seen the signs at football games, there's a piece of it that really didn't click. I know that Jesus died on the cross for me, but there's a piece of this verse that didn't click until this morning. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this morning, that word perish really jumped out at me. So I'm saying, OK, if you are taking away the, 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 the part of this punish, the punishment from us, if we don't have to perish, then who did all that perishing go to? Who perished for us? So we know that God so loved the world that he gave, but there had to be some perishing as well. There had to be some punishment because sin always has a penalty. The wages of sin is what? Death. So wherever there's sin, something has to die. But God got tired of the animal sacrifices. And Jesus said, you know what? I will go and I will redeem man to yourself. So Jesus was willing to perish for us. So how much are we loved by the Father and the Son? That God sent his Son to perish so that we could have life. I'm going to say that again. God sent his Son to perish so that we could have life. My father had an older son named Carlos. And Carlos is still here, but my father is not. And he had a younger son named Damien, the one that you're looking at. And I was dying. My kidneys were failing. But God had another son that was a perfect match. I'm sorry. My father had another son that was a perfect match for me. So he had a son who was willing for part of his body to perish so that I could have life. He was willing to go through a surgery for one of his kidneys to be removed to keep this son alive. We are the other sons. And which Jesus Christ said, I will go and I will perish for them so that they might continue to have life. 
God loves his church. God loves his church so much that he was willing to die for us so that we might have life. So, because he was, we are. Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 14. Because he was, we are. John 1, 14 says this. So the word became human or flesh and made his home among us. The word is Jesus Christ. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. What was he full of? Unfailing love and faithfulness. What was he full of? Unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So here's what we need to know about Jesus, that he was the Word made flesh. And what we are is the flesh being made Word. When you read your Bible and you get the word of God into you, this flesh is able to become word. How do we know this? You ever heard the term, you are what you eat? And, the, and Jesus said that man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So when you eat the word, you become the word. See, Jesus was the word made flesh, but we are flesh transitioning into word. And that is why we cannot be conformed to the patterns of this world, but we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So you need to get in that Bible and say, Lord, who am I? I I desire to be to go from flesh to word. And because we are members of his body church, we should be able to confess the things that he confessed over himself. So say this with me. I am, I am full, of full of unfailing love, unfailing love. And, faithfulness. and faithfulness. All right. Come on. I told you to say it, but I want you to really receive it this time. Let's say it again. I am, I am full, full of. Unfailing love, unfailing love and faithfulness. And faithfulness. Husbands, if you're full of unfailing love and faithfulness, your wife will testify to it. There should always be a witness to what you say that you are, right? And Jesus had witnesses to declare what he was. So if Jesus was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, it's the reason he was able to go to the cross and remain sinless. Why? He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. How many of you want to be full of unfailing love and faithfulness? Guess what? You are. Why? Because we are members of the body of Christ and everything that is in Jesus Christ is in us as well by faith you just have to activate it and believe it you've got to know that we are members of his body we are not just humans trying to be religious that's the law we're saved by grace God came and did everything for us he fulfilled the entirety of the law so that we might be called the sons and daughters of the most high God the righteousness that was in Jesus Christ is now in us say that with me the righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ is, now is now in me Listen to me. You don't have to perform righteousness. You just are righteous. You just are righteous because you believed on Jesus Christ for your salvation. And he made you holy and he made you blameless. Coming to church doesn't make you holy and blameless. Praying doesn't make you holy and blameless. Only what happened on Calvary 2,000 years ago makes you holy and blameless. And it becomes yours because you received it by faith. That's how much he loved his church. He died to make them holy. You don't come to church to become holy. Jesus already did that for us. He died to make his church holy. He washed us with his blood and he washes us with his word. We are the body of Christ. You better, you better give him some praise because I'm running out of breath. We got to come up out of this. We got to come out of this religion. 
We got to come out of this tradition. We got to come out of this performing. We got to come out of this faking. We got to be real. We got to we got to have what the Bible says we can have. We got to be who the Lord says that we can be because we're going to be judged one day. And we can fool each other, but we cannot fool him. He knows who belongs to him. Amen. So what else did Jesus do for us? What else did love do for us? Remember, the title of the message is that Christ loves his church. Well, love came and love obeyed for us. So listen, before he could die for you, he had to obey for you. Remember, because none of us were righteous. None of us were holy. So there had to be one that could do it. Oh, my goodness. There had to be one person who could obey the whole law their entire lives so that mankind could be saved by just believing on what he did for them. So before Christ could die for us to save us from our sins, he had to be found sinless. Hallelujah. I fall down. You fall down, but he never fell down. He just laid down his life so that his church might be saved. He fulfilled the righteousness of the law so that we might be made holy. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. And this is what it says. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God. What is it, church? A gift. When you love somebody, you give them things, right? For God so loved that he gave. So it says here, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task. Say this with me. I have work to do. Listen to me. Worshiping God in this sanctuary is not your work. Okay. Even what I'm doing up here is just part of my work. But part of my work is to empower you for your work. The work of the church is reconciliation. Can you say reconciliation? Reconciliation Reconciliation means this. Let's say that I go to the store with my son, Dominic, who's five years old now, and he's been begging me for a ball. So I get him a ball and I say, boy, leave this ball in the cart, this new basketball you've been wanting. And I turn my back and he's climbed into the cart and got the ball out. And I'm I'm talking to someone at the store, as often I do, see someone I know. And he's dribbling, 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 dribbling. And all of a sudden I hear crash, 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 bang, bang, bang. And I look in the aisle, aisle seven. And this boy has knocked over 62 bottles of wine. Now, you might not have come from where I come from. You might not have the past that I have. But it's not Mad Dog 2020, and it's not Wild Irish Rose. Like, Pastor, what is that? Don't Google it. Do not Google that. This is the expensive stuff. And it's over $1,000 worth of damage, right? This boy. Well, guess what? He doesn't have a job. He can't even pay for it. And the store manager's looking at me like, what are we going to no, What are you going to do about this? I'm going to have to go into my wallet and I'm going to have to reconcile what he has done. Hallelujah. That means that Dominic walks out of the store scot free, that he doesn't owe anybody anything because it's been made right for him. Now, dad's got a bill, but because I love him, I paid it. That's what reconciliation means, that you don't owe the charges against you have been paid in full. So let's read it now. Let's read it now. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given this task of reconciling people to him. So people, us sinners, we had a debt that we could not pay. 
And God gave Jesus a task of reconciling us back to the Father. 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Where was God? In Christ. Where was God? In Christ. Doing what? Reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he has given us, say this with me, all right? Here's your ministry. Here's your purpose. Everyone's saying, well, what is my purpose? I don't know what my ministry is. What am I supposed to be doing? It's right in the book. It says this. He has gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Say this with me. I have a message. You know what that means? It means you're a church. I know you come here to hear messages, but you are a message. You have a message inside of you because you are the body of Christ. You are the church. Amen. So he has given us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassador. Say this with me. I am, I am. An, ambassador an ambassador for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. When we plead, come back to God. I want you to look at someone in this place and just say this, come back to God. I want everybody in this place to look at somebody and say, come back to God. Now listen to me. When we do that out there, please hear this part. When we do that out there, it's actually God in us making an appeal to the world so that they can be reconciled. If we're not doing that, then we're not faithful ambassadors. Here's the, here's the part of the service where you can pull out your boots, the steel toe boots. If we're not doing that, then we're not acting as ambassadors for Christ because he said that we're supposed to be making an appeal to the world to come back to God. Amen? Amen? We are the body of Christ. Father, I come against the spirit of fear and embarrassment right now in Jesus' name. I come against God the thought that I'm a nobody. I'm not a pastor. I'm not this. I'm not that. But the word says that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I declare now in the name of Jesus that the gospel message that is inside of our belly, which screams out, come back to God, let it begin to come out now in the name of Jesus. Let rivers and rivers of living water begin to flow out of your church, not the building, but the people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we plead to the world to come back to God. So love has obeyed for us. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to skip down to verse 5. And it says this, that we have to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave. Say this with me. Lord, Lord help, me help me take the humble position, the humble position of, your of your slave. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Father, let that happen. Father, I pray that you would humble us. Humble us, God, as your servants. So many times we have uh, allowed the prosperity gospel message to flip positions to where we act as if you are our servant. But no, we will humble ourselves just as Jesus did as the position of a slave. It continues to say this and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's what Jesus did for you. Love loves his church and he loves us so much that he humbled himself in obedience to God so that we could be saved. So now we must ask ourselves this question. Do we have this same attitude? 
while God is living in our bodies. Remember, we just told you that Jesus had God living on the inside of him while he was reconciling the world to himself. It also says that God was in Jesus as he humbled himself in obedience and died on the cross. So we see that when God is in a body, check this out. When God lives in a body, that body should be humble to the spirit of God within. That body should be a servant to the spirit of God that lives on the inside of them, even to the point of our own death, because that's what Jesus did. Love obeyed for us. What else did Jesus do for us? Let's go to first Peter chapter two, verses 22 through 24. And it says this. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone because this is the law. We're listening to how he was obedient for us. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Something that we have to learn, church, is this. Since we are the body of Christ, we have the character of Christ, we have the spirit of Christ, we can obey like Christ. Listen to what he says. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. So that means this. When you are insulted, you don't retaliate. Why? Because you are the body of Christ and we are able to do what he did. When someone causes us to suffer, we don't threaten revenge. Why? Because we are the body of Christ and the spirit of Christ empowers us to do what Jesus did. And instead, here's what he did. He left his case in the hands of God. Say this with me. I will will leave my case case in the hands of God. That's exactly what you do when somebody wrongs you. That's exactly what we do when someone insults us. We don't get revenge. We just say, you know what? I leave this case in the hands of God. That's how Jesus stayed sinless. He didn't concentrate on the case. He didn't think about, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. No, I'm just going to give this case to God. Because why? Because he judges fairly. We won't judge fairly, but he will. All right. Let's see what else Jesus did for his church, whom he loved so much. He denied himself for us. Love denied himself for us. Let's go to Luke chapter nine, verses 57 and 58. And it says this, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. No matter where you go, I will follow you and I will go with you. Verse 58 says this, though. And here was here was love's luxury. Let's let's hear how Jesus was willing to live for us because he denied himself for us. He came from the kingdom of God where the streets are paved with gold, where they bow down and where they worship him. He came from heaven where there is no disease and no lack. He came from this glorious place, the kingdom of God, to our earth as a man. And listen to what he says in verse 58. He came from all of that. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. So Jesus was transient. He was always moving. And that time, they would stay with people in whatever city they might go to, and there might be times where he had no place to lay his head. The king of the universe. All right. Love came down and removed himself from luxury so that his church could be saved. What else do we see Jesus doing? We see him denying access of pleasure. In Hebrews chapter 415, it says this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. See, when we uh, look at each other, we may say to ourselves, those of us that have struggles and temptations and addictions, you don't know what I'm going through. But Jesus says, you know what? I do know what you're going through because he was tempted in every single way, yet he did not fail. He did not sin. 
Jesus also did this for us. He was willing to die even before he died. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46, we see Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And it says in verse 38, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And we know that they all fell asleep on him. The church of that age, the ones that he called close to him, fell asleep on him. Church, we cannot afford to fall asleep on our job. We see that viruses have been released in the earth, causing the death of millions of people. But some of those millions of people died not knowing Jesus Christ because the ambassadors are asleep. Church, it's time for us to wake up. We also see that love gave himself for us. It was everything was placed on his body for the benefit of our body. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53, please. We're just about through Isaiah chapter 53. You must realize that everything that happened to his body was for our body's sake, for the sake of his church. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. This begins to talk about our Lord right here. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. So all those things that happened to his body was for us, his body now. He experienced all those terrible things so we would not have to. He was beaten so we could be whole and he was whipped so that we could be healed. Verse six tells us that all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. The final thing that Jesus Christ did for us, his church, whom he loved so much, love purified us. Jesus washed his body. Let's go to John chapter 13, verses 3 through 9. It says this, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. And that he had come from God and would return from God. Listen to this. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. Over what? Everything. everything. And that he had come from God. Where did he come from? God. And would return to God. Where would he return to? God. So he knew he was a God's son. He knew he had all power and all authority. But listen to what he does in verse 4. Knowing all this, he got up from the table, took off his robe, and wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet drying them with the towel he had around them. My goodness, does this, this is powerful. We see here that he knew of all the authority and power he had. He knew that he came from God, knew he was returning to God, but was still a servant. Church, I think what has happened to many people in churches is we leave our old life and somehow think that we are better than those people now. But God knew where he came, that Jesus knew where he came from, knew where he was going back to, yet still stooped down low to wash the feet of his church. He began to wash and clean his church even before going to the cross. Verse 6, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? 
Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Church, unless he washes us, we, won't not be- we will not belong to him. Simon Peter then exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. So he was beginning to the process of washing the church even then. Our final passage is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. We need to see how much God loves his church. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. Say this with me, church. God God loves loves me. me. He gave up his life life. to make me me. holy Holy. and and clean. Praise God. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. This says that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the body, and it says that a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. Church, we are the bride of Christ. And when you love each other, you're showing love to yourself. It's so important that you know that if one of us isn't doing well in the local church body, then all of us are affected. If my foot is hurt, although my, although my head might not be hurting, I still can't walk as fast as I need to go. I still can't do all the things that I need to do because part of me is hurting. You receive today the name of a person on a card. And that person is part of your body. And the better that person is doing, the better you are doing. Because we are one and the same. It's so important that we allow the love of God to grow here between us because we are his church and we are his body. And what happens here strengthens us so that we might go out and be the ambassadors that he is calling us to be. Please stand to your feet at this time. We are the body of Christ. None of us has every gift. The, gift is just, the gifts are distributed between us. None of us can do it all by ourselves. I don't care how spiritual, spiritual you act, how loud you worship, how, how much you love the Lord. He still made it so that the body needs the body that we need to be interlocked and we need to love each other. But you know what that's going to take? It's going to take a lot of grace. It's going to take a lot of grace because people will get on your nerves in the church, in the body of Christ. People will hurt you in the body of Christ. People will say things against you in the body of Christ. Why? Because the enemy weasels in and he desires to pull us apart. So will you be honest in this moment as it relates to the body of Christ? And if there are some severed relationships in here, they need to be fixed. If you are thinking that there is a person in this place that, you know what? She never speaks to me. He never speaks to me. Do you know what they're thinking? He never speaks to me. She never speaks to me. Be aware of what the enemy uses to try to pull the body apart. We are his body. The only time the body was needed to be pulled apart 
was when Christ died for us. And that's what we just celebrated with communion was the breaking of his body so that we could all be one. Father, I pray that as this series goes on, that we would begin to make the connection that in order to become a we, part of me must die. And in order for us to become a we, it means that it's not always about what I want and when I want it. It's not about my favorite song. It's not about the seat I like to sit in. It's not about my well-being alone. God, you have given us gifts to serve each other. Before my father passed away, years before he passed away, he would tell me this. Because as soon as church dismissed, I would hit that door. I would be gone. And he began to see this pattern. And God had already spoke to him that potentially that I would be the one that would leave this church after he was gone. So he said, Damien, you got to stop leaving as soon as service is over. He said, you need to begin to get into the hearts of the people. So, Father, I say that to this body right now. We are so quick to make it about us. When there could be people around us that are hurting. We need to get into the hearts of the people. Lord, would you slow us down? Because all church is is a religious activity if we just want to come and leave as fast as possible. If we are truly the church, then we are the body of Christ. And the body should care for one another and love one another. And I know it can't happen just because we say it should. It's going to take effort. So, Father, that effort has to be lived out by faith and obedience. They will know us by our love for each other. If we are ambassadors, they will know us by our love for each other. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that the me's become we's. The me's become we's. Lord, where there needs to be forgiveness, allow allow forgiveness to happen. Where there is self-centeredness, let that go to the wayside. Where there is pride, let that be removed, God. We cancel pride now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we humble ourselves as servant. If Jesus, who was the Son of God, who knew the power and authority that he had, who knew that he came from God and was going to return to God, tied on an apron and begin to clean the dirty feet of disciples, who are we? Who are we? We are his church. We are his body. He's not coming to clean any more feet. He's not coming to tie an apron on anymore. It's our turn. Say this with me. It's our turn. It's our turn to be his hands and feet. We are his body now. Christ has no body on earth except ours now. Father, we need you.